In this video, we want to take a look at establishing an order of operations when it comes to interfacing with different applications that you need to work with as you develop an automation. So what we want to do is develop a hierarchy of automation operations. Sound good? Let's get started. So imagine this scenario. You've been handed an automation opportunity. That use case or that opportunity has a variety of different applications you need to work with, from different thick client applications to those that exist with an API and those that don't. How do you determine the best approach for working with each application? That's exactly what we want to talk about. If you don't have a standardized approach for the way that you're interfacing with different applications and consistency in the way that you're working with apps, that's something that we need to fix. So how do we do that? Let's talk about a structured approach to determining your order of operations when working with a new application. So when it comes to working with an application and any automation that I'm going to build, the very first thing I'm going to check for is to see if I have an available application specific package. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say I need to work with something in Microsoft SharePoint or Office 365 or ServiceNow, right? For those applications, I'm going to look through all the available packages in my control room and see if I have an application specific package designed to work with that application. If I do, that's going to be my number one choice for interfacing with that application. If I don't, that's where I need to start going down this hierarchy. But this is the number one thing that I'm looking for when I'm working with another app. Do I have a dedicated application specific package that's already been established, already set up for me to work with. There are a ton of available packages that come out of box with Automation Anywhere. And so that's my first place that I'm going to look to see if I have a way to connect to that application. If that's not the case, the next thing I'm going to check is to see, do we have a custom or bot store package that we've already built or already downloaded or already installed that will enable me to work with that application? Let me give you a couple examples here. If I need to interface with an application and I don't have something in my control room already, I can head to Bot Store. And in Bot Store, we have tons of pre built packages, automations, and templates that you can download and install in your control room. Those that have been built by Automation Anywhere largely have their source code available on our GitHub as well. So that's a great resource for you to be able to extend the capabilities of the core Automation Anywhere platform. You also have the ability to build your own custom packages thanks to our package SDK. So if you're at all familiar with Java, you have the ability to build and compile and then install your own custom package. If that's something you're interested in, we've got some videos and some content on that within our Automation Anywhere community. Now, if both of those things fail, I got to keep going down my hierarchy. The next thing I'm looking for is I'm going to use the connector builder to build my own custom package. This is a new thing, so you may not be familiar with the phrasing I'm using here, but connector builder enables me to either manually define API endpoints that I want to hit or to import a YAML file and automatically build a package for me. The nice thing about this is when I import, let's say a YAML file, all of the defined endpoints of that API and all of the required inputs that I need to fill in, the day that I need to send for my get or my post, whatever it is, all of that's already defined and that gets built automatically for me with the connector builder. It will show up in my control room as a package. Now, why do I have that below these other two? Well, if I'm using an application specific package, typically what's happening is the data that's coming back to me is already pre-formatted in an Automation Anywhere friendly data type. If I'm using Connector Builder or if I'm connecting to an API, which is gonna be our next one, spoiler alert, if I'm connecting to an API or Connector Builder, I'm gonna get a JSON back. And that means I need to parse that JSON. So not everyone is terribly comfortable with parsing JSON. We do have some courses on that. So if that's something you're interested in, take a look at Automation Anywhere University courses and you can learn more about how to parse JSON. But that's why I'm prioritizing the custom or bot store package as well as the application specific package from Automation Anywhere above a connector builder built package. Again, if you're not familiar with Connector Builder, we have an excellent tutorial on it. I would encourage you to check it out. It's a really cool capability that I've been really excited about and something I've been asking for for a long time. So I'm happy to see that it's here. Next, 
I'm going to try to interface with the API. Now, a lot of you are probably scoffing at this list and saying, how dare you put API on the fourth uh, approach? And the reason is, is just like I explained, the application specific packages that have already been built, those are going to make it a lot easier for me to interface with these applications. Many times those are relying on the exact same APIs that I would be interfacing with if I did it all manually. So it's really just helping me to save some time. But if I don't have a package that's already been built for said application that I'm interfacing with, then I'm going to reach for one of the REST or SOAP packages, right? And that's going to enable me to interface with any kind of API, take that response back and start to parse it either with the JSON parser or with an XML parser. Again, the nice thing about this, and you'll see we're, we're kind of changing the color here. So we're, we're going we're gonna to slowly fade into some darker colors. But the nice thing about this, APIs are incredibly reliable, right? I know that if it works today, it's likely going to work tomorrow. There are APA changes. There are retired endpoints and things like that. And that naturally happens with the evolution of any software platform. But those are very reliable. They're fast and they're going to give me accurate data every single time. Hopefully, right? If I know the API that I'm working with. Next, we have Recorder and Generative Recorder. And I've highlighted these two kind of separately here, but Recorder enables you to interface with a web interface, an application UI, a Windows thick client. It enables me to work with the different applications just like a user would using Windows, right? I can click a window, I can click a menu, I can go through and navigate through a web application, fill data, I can enter data into a form, I can submit it. All of those things are capable with Recorder. Now, you may not be familiar with Generative Recorder, and this is something that just came out with the dot one and 32 release, I think it was enhanced, but this enables me to essentially use generative AI to find web elements on a page, even if the page has seen some layout changes. So we all use SaaS based applications. If a SaaS based provider has, let's say, done an update to their web page and the login used to be over here and now it's on the right hand side of the screen, generative recorder will help me to still find that element during runtime and prevent my automation from hard crashing. Now, the other nice thing about this is it's going to notify me in my control room and in my logs so that I know, hey, this automation was saved from, you know, potentially failing. And hey, you might want to go update where you did your object cloning so that you can fix this automation going forward. The nice thing is it's not going to be a 2 a.m. call. Hey, my automation didn't run. It's still going to work, but it's also going to give me that notification that, hey, you might want to go and do this update because we noticed some changes in this application. So this is the best of both worlds, in my opinion, right? My application or my automation is going to stay running. But at the same time, I'm aware that I need to make some changes and I need to go revisit that application because, hey, it worked this time and that's totally fine. It'll probably work next time, right? But there may be other applications that either I hadn't interfaced with or I hadn't used in this particular automation. And this can be a great clue for me to know that I need to go and do some updates. Next, again, this is probably a surprising one, uh, browser run JavaScript. There are situations where I'm interfacing with a web-based application, and for whatever reason, I just can't get the recorder worked out, right? Maybe I can't clone that specific object. Maybe it's in some kind of div that I don't really have access to really easily. It's in a submenu, whatever is the case. I have the ability to essentially inject JavaScript into that page using the browser run JavaScript action. And I absolutely love this. We've got some great tutorials on this on our community forum. So go to community.automationanywhere.com and you'll be able to find some of those tutorials. I think we have one that I wrote a while ago that like splashes up confetti on the page. Not the most business specific one, but it shows you how you can write a JavaScript function and then inject that into a page and execute it. And so this is incredibly helpful. When we have people who are participating in our bot games challenges, a lot of people will use browser run JavaScript because it can go extremely fast, but it enables me to click buttons. It enables me to read data from a page. It enables me to change elements. Technically, I could change the CSS of a page if I wanted to, too. I don't know that there's a great use case for that, but browser run JavaScript is another thing that I'll reach for that if for whatever reason, recorder or generative recorder isn't working for me, browser run JavaScript is what I will reach for. Next below that is Python and the DLL package. Now, again, probably not the specific order that people would have expected here, but 
Python and uh, .NET have a lot of available libraries that enable me to interface with different applications in different ways. I'll give a really specific example. When I started working with Salesforce and their backend, I didn't understand the API right away. And it wasn't terribly obvious to me how to interact with different objects, especially some of the custom objects that show up in Salesforce. However, they had a Python library that made it really easy and I could find a lot of really good tutorials for it. Now, does that mean I should have just stuck with Python forever? Nope, I had to learn the API still. But this enabled me to interface with an application that I otherwise was having some trouble with. So if I have an application that I know works really well with Python or I've got this really good available library and it makes it a lot easier for me to use it, this can be a great approach. And I kind of am using Python and, and a .NET DLL here a bit interchangeably. One caveat I would say though, if I'm gonna go the Python route, I do have to be aware that the Python version, the libraries that I need, everything like that, needs to be set up on any bot runner that may execute this particular automation. So if I'm working with something like a device pool, it's just something I wanna keep in mind because I'll need to make sure that that Python version and all dependent libraries have been installed everywhere where this may execute. So that's not to say it's not great to use, but just a caveat to make sure you understand exactly how you need to deploy it. All right, as you can see in the colors, things are getting a little bit more uh, towards the red side. Keystrokes. So let's say that I have tried all of these other options. And I, you know, I would say that this one probably comes up usually in legacy applications, not something that uh, is a more modern application. But if I'm having trouble working with the user interface and for whatever reason, recorder isn't working, and I don't have the ability to inject JavaScript and it's probably a thick client app, I may need to go the keystroke route. You can do this, yes, and it enables you to basically string together lots of keystrokes. The caveat would be, you need to make sure that your automation isn't running faster than the application that it's dependent on. What I mean by that is I could send tons of operations to the application one after another super fast and I'm tabbing through stuff and I'm entering data and I'm using variables and I'm blasting that into the application. If the application that I'm automating is not able to keep up, I'm quickly going to lose track of where I was and my tabs that I thought were gonna work aren't working because that page is still refreshing or we haven't committed that transaction fully yet. So you'll wanna make sure that you add plenty of delays and waits in there to make sure that you're keeping track of where you are with automating the application. Getting more red, image recognition. Again, one that I don't know a lot of people are familiar with, but I wanna bring this to your attention as it is an available capability. With image recognition, I'm essentially establishing a needle and a haystack. And I'm trying to use needle as a really small thing that I'm trying to find in a much bigger window, right? And that's my haystack. So if I'm going to use this, let's say I have a page that has a login button. I would create the needle, which is basically a small screenshot of that login page. And my haystack would be the entire login page itself. And I'm basically saying, hey, if you can find this element within the context of this much larger page, then do this. And my operations are things like take a left click or a right click or things like that. So if I'm going to use image recognition, yes, you can use it. Uh, but again, I'm gonna make sure that I've exhausted all of these other options before I'm getting to the point of image recognition. And while we're on the topic of image recognition, one other package I wanna call out is the OCR package. And the OCR package doesn't enable you to click things like you can with image recognition, but it does enable you to read data from a page. So let's say I had an application window that was open. I can use the OCR package to capture either the entire window or capture a specific area on the page. Again, it's helpful for me being able to read context. It's going to return to me whatever text was recognized in that specific zone, that specific area, or the specific window but it helps me to have some context for where I am within the application. Finally, the last one on my list here is mouse clicks. And I have this at the very bottom because mouse clicks is very dependent on the X, Y coordinates of where I am within the screen. So let's say that I've just clicked to activate a window and then I want to maximize it, that's great. I know that I should be on, let's say a 1920 by 1080 screen. At that point, I need to click a specific button and I expect that button to always be located at the following XY coordinates, right? 
if that button moves around, mouse clicks are not going to work well for me, right? Because it's strongly dependent on that exact X, Y coordinate. So this is not going to work great with a dynamic web interface that is moving things around based on sometimes the tables two lines and sometimes the tables five lines. If I have, again, I think legacy application is the most applicable here, but if I have a very specific legacy application, I know that when I maximize it, things are always in the exact same place and I literally have no other way to automate this interface, then yes, I will reach for mouse clicks. But I'm gonna do some things with some of these other operations like image recognition to see if I can detect what page I'm on and if the mouse clicked worked and some stuff like that. So you may consider stacking some of these together. One that I don't have specifically in the list that I know some people will ask about is terminal emulator. And I would specifically put terminal emulator up within the application specific package because there is a specific application package that you should be using if you're emulating any kind of terminal operations. And so I would put that in that very top bucket. But this is my order of operations. So if I'm ever building a new automation and I'm working with some applications or I'm working with some uh, interfaces that I haven't used before, this is exactly what I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna see, do I have an application specific package? Do I need to build something? Is there an API? Can I use Recorder? All of these questions I'm gonna ask myself and I'm gonna kind of flow through this. And you know, honestly, the more that I'm sticking to that green stuff, the more reliable my automation is gonna be, likely the more quickly it's going to execute. As I start getting into the red and the orange stuff, uh, I'm getting a little bit more hesitant about how well this is gonna work long term and how much babysitting I'm gonna to need to do on this particular automation. So, quick recap with a few key takeaways that I wanna dial in on. Have a plan. You wanna be consistent with the approaches that you're taking to different applications. If developer A, developer B, and developer C are all using different interfaces to connect to and automate the same application, that's gonna be problematic when it comes time for supporting, maintaining, and updating these automations. So take Salesforce, for example. If someone's using the UI, another person is using the Salesforce package built into Automation Anywhere, and another person is just directly using the Salesforce API, that's now 3x the support that I need to supply to those different automations versus if I'm just using one consistently, I know all of my automations will be built the same way. If you aren't familiar with some of the approaches that we talked about, image recognition, using recorder, or generative recorder, if I use some phrases that you hadn't seen before or hadn't considered, consider checking those out on AAU. We've got plenty of new courses that have already been delivered. We've got more on the way covering all of these topics in depth. So be sure to check those out. Plan to learn some of those topics if you don't know them already. Another key point is focus on reusability. Regardless of using an API or using Recorder or using an inbuilt package, think about how I can build this element once and then reuse it in other opportunities, whether that's accelerating your own development in the future or accelerating the development of someone on your team or within your organization. So think about those things. What can I build today that I can reuse later on? Maybe I use that as a subtask or I use it as a task within my larger process. Also think about how I can make this available to the team. Maybe I have a SharePoint where we put all of our reusable assets, or maybe I just have like a libraries folder in the root of bots and we put all of our reusable assets there so that when I go to build a new automation, I first go to check there to see what do I have that's already built that I can reuse to accelerate my development. Finally, it's really important to make sure you're working from templates. Whether you're building with process first or whether you're building with a task bot first, it's really important to use some of the new templates that have been rolled out with Automation Anywhere. Whether you've created your own or you're using one of ours, the templates ensure that I've got consistency in the way I'm doing logging, log management, error handling, screenshots, retries, things like that. So consider using a template, a bot shell, a bot framework, some of those phrases are used interchangeably, but consider using those if you're not already. Also, when you're using a lot of this UI-based stuff or you're working with applications that are less than reliable, consider using a loop within your try-catch block so that you can do a concept of retries left. Again, we have a video on this on our community forum. We've got a little bit of a tutorial on how to do it, but you can essentially set this up so that 
if I'm expecting the page to load, but for whatever reason it didn't, and I'm trying to click a button and it failed the first time and I don't need to click it again because usually that works, I can set up a concept of retries left where I'm checking to see, did that operation fire off correctly? If not, I'm gonna run it again. If not, I'll run it again before I finally fail out and say, hey, I'm gonna log this error. It didn't work after the third retry. I've done this in a lot of my own builds. I even log the fact that I've, you know, it worked on retry number two of five so that I can go back later on, check my logs and make sure that my retries concept is actually working and is actually applying. Cool. So that was an overview of determining a hierarchy for the way that you build and deliver automations. Hopefully you found that helpful. Hopefully you can adopt that in your future builds and it will help you to accelerate your decision making when working with brand new applications. Thanks for watching and go be great.